Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our event today. We are very honored and delighted to invite Dr. Huang Yijie, uh, Dr. J, to our uh, faculty and discuss about this very interesting topic: China as a driver of a post-Western global imaginary. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, and a little background introduction about Dr. Huang. Dr. Huang uh, is a senior assistant professor at Leiden University in international relations. And her, his research focus uh, cover a wide range of culture and identity politics in East Asia, and also theories of nationalism, etc., etc. And I personally met Dr. Huang the first time a professor at Suzuki's event, uh, and uh, every time I listen to Professor Huang's cheering and thoughts, I find it really uh, inspiring and impressive in the way that um, I think Professor Huang's research brought us a perspective that is very unique in understanding East Asian politics and in understanding China. And I am always impressed by his uh, intellectual capacity to navigate and to move around uh, Western concepts to Eastern ones. So I personally look very much forward to this lecture. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Wong. Okay, can you hear me clearly? Okay, good. So. So good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Su, and uh, for your very kind introduction, and also the invitation, um, and also from um, Professor Wang. And, um, so it's um, my great pleasure to be um, here today. So the, my presentation today actually is a part of um, my ongoing three years from research projects funded by uh, CCK uh, and the. Uh, Wang Chongqiu is also part of this, um, of this project. So um, the title of this project is The Birth of the International Studies in China in Taiwan. So the project's basics explore um, how international studies as a scientific discipline um, emerged and developed in China and Taiwan. So then, um, the initial part of, um, um, of this project has been published in two journal articles in the review of international studies. So the talk today um, is mainly from uh, the contents of the second okay. speaker. So the um, yeah so the, the today's talk is mainly from the second part of the um, yeah, from the content of the second paper, and those articles are open access. So the, um, those who are interesting, actually, you can download and read them uh, by yourself for free. So what I'm going to do today is, um, so the first, I will talk about the Eurocentrism um, in international studies to briefly uh, explain why I'm uh, undertaking uh, this research project. Second, I will illustrate how international studies have developed as a discipline in mainland China, mainland China and the PRC. And it relates to the population of the national and international relations in the first century. And in the third part, uh, I will provide some yeah, audience with my own reflection on the developments of the Chinese school of China from a post-colonial uh, perspective. So let's move on uh, to the first part. So the uh, yeah. So since that it's established uh, it's at the, the beginning of the 20th century, the IR discipline has always uh, been characterized by the eccentrics. So the books, um, yeah, the books the making the global international relation published by Acharya and Barry Dusan two uh, years ago. Uh, in the books, they basically describe uh, the development of the discipline. So as they point out in the books, although it is generally um, believed that um, 1919 was the first year of the IR discipline, before 1919, many ideas and practice of international politics had actually appeared 
and existed in all over the, the world, uh, including the non-Western world. However, the development of the IR theory after 1990 is still based on the Eurocentric and Euro European practice of the international relations. Uh, that is the Westphalian system, as well as Western philosophical thought and political theory. As a result, the contemporary mainstream IR theory is not much more than an abstraction of the Western history, uh, it woven with the Western political theory. And after the Second, um, the second World War, this Westcentric spiritual was once again strengthened. Um, at the same time, the center of the history has been transferred uh, from the Europe to the United States, uh, become the US or American centric phenomenon. There is no doubt so that in the United States had always had the most influential research institution, including university research institution and also a foundation. And also they issued more IR journal than any other um, country. In addition, a recognition of international studies often occurs in other developed countries uh, outside the West, such as Japan, or newly industrialized country and region such as Taiwan and other um, developing countries. Uh, so as um, Steve Smith, um, the English, um, British um, IR scholar, he uh, pointed out, so he said American domination in the discipline is not really uh, based on the quantitative indicator, uh, such as number of the people, publication, and so on and so forth. But more importantly, um, it's about the paradigm dominance. So the reason why the study of IR is um, flourish in the United States is closely related to the um, experience of the United States as a hegemony to power after the Second World War. So then, when the Cold War began, the discipline of IR in the United States quickly adapted to the needs of the United States. So the United States, they need IR scholars to study international politics in order to find a way to contain the Soviet Union's expansion. Therefore, the mainstream IR scholarship, um, under the guise generating um, generating of you know, objective scientific knowledge, actually reflects the identity and also the interests of the United States. Although the United States and hegemony um, has been uh, criticized by other countries in the world, its hegemonic status um, has never been uh, replaced. So even if other countries look at us, um, if um, they might uh, surpass the United States in a certain period, such as the Soviet Union around the 1970s or Japan around the 1980s, they did not have a global, sustainable, and all-round uh, appeal of the American models. Therefore, American hegemony in uh, the contemporary world not only enjoy technological, economic, or political superiority, but also involve cultural, ideational, and also ideological uh, leadership. So the Italian Marxist uh, thinker uh, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, um, he revised the orthodox Marxist theory uh, by emphasizing the importance of the superstructure of the ideology to the economic structure as well as the importance of the civil society um, to the political uh, society. So Gramsci is um, the revision of the um, orthodox Marxism uh, explained uh, the development um, of the working class uh, consciousness. But more importantly, um, its value to uh, develop. So I don't know how much um, you know about, I'm sure that everyone knows um, the Gramsci but uh, Gramsci actually, um, these two um, orthodox the Marxism, um, they, they think it's actually the, the superstructure um, is determined by uh, the base, and the, which is essentially a material force, including the means of production. But to Gramsci, um, the rule of the Bojong seeds must not only be conducted through um, the developments of the productive forces, but also through the hegemonies of the culture and ideology um, in the upper structure. Uh, that's why the Grouchy, he, he wrote, so, so two things are absolutely 
necessary for the life of the state to within the forms and consent coercion, expression, state of choice, political society, and civil society, and so on and so forth. So then, the Canadians I ask other Robert Cox. So he applies the Grouchy's idea to international relation and state that in, so in order to become the hegemonics in international relation, um, the country must uh, establish the world order, which was universal in conception. In other words, in the establishment of the hegemonics in world politics is not only based on the material power, but also includes the dimension of the um, um, belief or the ideologies. So for Cox, um, um, the term hegemony is different from dominance. So dominance, actually, you can imagine in today's world politics, maybe Russia uh, is, um, yeah, can be characterized as, um, as dominance, but not uh, the hegemony. So to Robert Cox, he says the rule by force alone is not enough to establish hegemony uh, because ideology uh, has not yet uh, penetrated into social life. So only when the rule um, is ideologically uh, consistent or in the harmony with the ruler uh, can it be called a hegemony uh, because um, yeah, and also its rank uh, can be consolidated and, and lasted. Uh, therefore, the most effective way to control people is not force them to do things they would not do. Uh, would not do but to make them think they are doing those things right. It is important to be noticed that the purpose of hegemony is still to maximize his or her own interest and power. They are not selfless, fair, or neutral. I think some, the Western American centrism is still very, very kind of evident in, in, the, in the inner society. Taiwan. If you look at some of the international news reported by, by the Chinese media, like the Zhangjiao Fuji, you can find the lecture more than 95 or even 99 percentage of the news resource uh, Western has plus Japan's uh, Chinese media. So we simply take the view of the West, especially the United States, uh, for granted, and we often uh, unconsciously. Uh, see the world from Americans' point of view. However, um, any great power in history uh, has its rise and fall, and the United States is no uh, exception. So the liberal world order dominates by the West, um, especially after the outbreaks of the financial crisis in um, 19, uh, 2008, and later on, the Brexit and also as well as, well as the rise of the populism in Western countries, they have all challenged the current liberal order uh, led by the United States. And also the stability of American society itself has been declining in recent years, especially under Donald Trump's his administration. So some scholars have pointed out that you know, the international norms, institution, and very system Structures by the West um, are, are, are collapsing um, and um, disintegrating. So the world is entering um, the post Western um, era. So at the present, I think the academic circles, we haven't really um, yet reached the consensus on the communication of this um, the post Western era um, or the post Western international order. So whether the non-Western world um, will dominate in the future, or whether the West and non-West will jointly build um, a future um, order uh, has become the matter of debate in academic, uh, academic circles. Regardless of um, the answer, I think with the decline of the West uh, and also the wider dis uh, dissemination of the non-Western cultural classical concepts uh, in the past uh, two, one or two decades, I think the views and experience of the non-Western subjects have increasingly been recognized as an indispensable, indispensable part of the discipline. So various research agenda appear, um, and also, yeah, they have um, been put forward around these things. So among the, 
among the most representative and influential one are two initiatives. So the first one is the non-Western and global IR. And the second one is the, um, the post-Western IR. So the other advocates of the non-Western um, IR theories, such as Acharya and Barry Buzan, um, so they discussed the limitation of the discipline of IR and also its theory as early as the 1990s. Um, but with the rise of the non-Western worlds, such as China and India, in the real world, it becomes more organized in agenda. Uh, so in 2005, uh, later was um, yeah, um, the widespread known uh, non-Western IR theory, uh, this project. So, and uh, China, he later became, uh, became um, the, uh, the president of an um, international uh, studies association. Uh, so in, um, in his um, yeah, 2014, um, inauguration speech, uh, he formally uh, proposed uh, the concept of the um, uh, global IR. So another initiative was um, yeah, the, the West Beyond, sorry, the World Beyond the West Research uh, series initiated by Anne Dickner and others. So they also hope to reflect um, the different local concerns and traditional geographical and cultural epistemology. Uh, from the perspective of um, the territory uh, in order to restore and also seek an alternative way to re-image um, international politics. So regardless um, of um, the agenda, I think this is scholar, they will try to uh, expect to develop um, diverse IR theory and concepts uh, based on the non-Western historical uh, experience, uh, thoughts, and viewpoints. So the rise um, of the interest in non-Western thoughts in the field of international study has very, very positive significance for the development of, um, uh, yeah, um, of the Chinese IR theory. So in China, uh, many Chinese um, scholars believe that um, a Chinese school of IR should be uh, established. So in recent decades, um, uh, various attempts uh, have um, been made um, Established Chinese theory of international relations. So, for those um, advocates, the Chinese IR not only needs to develop its own epistemological uh, system to understand international relations from a Chinese perspective, but it also involves the question of um, what kind of a world order um, China wants. However, you should um, be point out that the um, appearance of the Chinese consciousness in Chinese international studies actually predates uh, the current appeal of the Chinese school. So the, like uh, this slide, I think the, when the PR, yeah, when the, like, like this slide is sure, I think when the PRC, the People's Republic of China, uh, established um, was as, yeah, they have already, the uh, Beijing's already um, attached the great importance um, to the international studies. So immediately after the founding of the PRC um, in 1949, the various research and also teaching institutes of the international studies were established to train its foreign uh, policy affairs of the future. So at the beginning of the um, at the yeah at the beginning of the establishment of the Germany University of China in 1950s so the Department of the Diplomacy uh, was also established. So they offer nearly three, uh, 30 courses in international relations, international law, and so on and so forth. So for those major architects of the international studies in the PRC, so they think the Chinese the diplomatic world needs the support of the entire discipline, um, and also the other related field. So the international studies IR was concerned with the survival of the regimes according to the political elites of the Communist Party. Therefore, as a discipline, the study of international relations must have a Chinese perspective from a uh, very, very uh, beginning. And also in the late 1950s and early 1960s, there was a dispute between the CCP and also the Communist Party of the Soviet Union over the ideological uh, dominance 
So on the one hand, the Chinese government in Beijing believe that they need to strengthen uh, their own the Marxism or Leninism research uh, to seek the right to speak in the socialist camp. On the other hand, they also wanted to establish their own research agenda, uh, research position, the viewpoints, and also the methods on international issues under the guidance of the Marxism to resist uh, the Western uh, discourse. Therefore, at um, the end of um, the 1963, uh, under the initiative of the Chinese the Premier uh, Prime Minister, the Zhou Enlai, uh, the Chinese government, they choose the Beijing, Yuanming, and also Fudan University uh, to establish the Department of International Politics. So the 10 years, um, the Cultural Revolution um, caused the serious the damage to um, China's academic uh, development. So facing the Chinese the, uh, China's academic uh, stagnation, Deng Xiaoping um, so he declared that after he took office in uh, 1978, if, yeah, he, yeah, they think it is necessary for China to quickly uh, make up lesson um, in Chinese um, in the field of political science and international relations. So subsequently, since the 1979, the Chinese government has been engaged in efforts um, to institu institutionalize the discipline of international uh, relation. So during this period, um, the following uh, phenomenon can be uh, observed. So the first um, is the promotion of the international studies program. So in addition to uh, restoration of um, Beijing, Yuanming, and Fudan, um, these three universities I mentioned earlier. So other major universities, um, they also began uh, to offer um, IR courses. And so a large number of the students were engaged in international studies, uh, which also formed a group of um, professional um, Chinese IR scholars and also research uh, community. And secondly, um, a large number of the research uh, result, sorry, research results of the Western international studies, uh, such as the, um, especially the mainstream uh, American uh, academic sports, had been translated or um, introduced to China, so including all the major theories in the United States and, and yeah. So this has enabled China's international studies to absorb the large amount of the Western philosophy, Western IR theory, and also their viewpoints, and also their um, research methodology, with the goal of um, uh, strengthening their own uh, theoretical uh, foundation. And at the same time, though, it's, um, the Chinese IR scholars uh, have also begun to examine the Western theories through the Chinese cases and try to incorporate some more Chinese perspective and ideas. So Chinese scholars are also aware of the problem of the Western American centuries. So they, uh, they have a reservation about um, introducing all the Western theory to, to China. So they believe um, if they uh, blindly uh, chase Western knowledge, uh, they will always uh, be the follower. Therefore, they inevitably raise the question such as so how to establish China's own perspective, its own style, and also its own language. Um, in addition, some, the increasing sense of autonomy in China's academic circle of international study, and also the call for create their own theory, are also related to the introduction of the English school um, into China, and also the, uh, the prevalence of the post-structuralism or post-positivism theory um, in the West. So on the one hand, in the 1990s, the Chinese scholars are exposed to the works and whole idea of the English school more than um, they had been before, and again, a lot of inspiration. So the writing of them, Kei Lin Fu, uh, Martin White, and Barry Zhang and other, they have all attracted attention successfully um, in China. So since there can be um, an English school, so they wonder why can not, yeah, what? Yeah, they should be um, a Chinese school as well. On the other hand, um, during this period, um, 
Chinese scholars also observe um, the result, the research result of um, post positivism, so including uh, constructivism, uh, post structuralism, critical theory, and feminism, and so on and so forth. So, some Chinese scholars actually they um, question the ontology and its epistemology of the mainstream IR studies. So, they advocate some incorporating the resources of um, Chinese traditional culture and historical experiences into the theoretical discussion of international studies in China. So after um, 2000, more and more scholars in China um, they proposed to establish the Chinese School um, of International uh, Relation, um, IR theory. So among them is uh, the most representative um, Case is Qin Yaqin of the um, Chinese Foreign Affairs um, University. So, what is um, the Chinese school of, um, of IR theory? So, Qin Yaqin he believed um, the two characteristics are needed um, for the Chinese school. So, the first, um, it must originate it in the cultural and historical context of China. Second, um, it can gain the universal significance um, in its um, uh, development. So from this perspective, um, the Chinese school has an attempt to theorize today's international relations based on the traditional Chinese school of thought, historical experiences, and also diplomatic practice. So by judging from the efforts of the um, Chinese school in recent years, um, I think most of, um, of their efforts um, have focused on the use of um, the uses of um, Chinese history the cultural and also the traditional philosophical idea. And among them, um, the three theoretical approach um, that have caused the most discussion are first the Yin Shui Hong, uh, is with moral realism, Zhao Tingjiang's Tingjiang system, and Qin Ya Qin is a theory of the religion level. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the argumentation of these three scholars, but I will just very, very briefly uh, introduce their main uh, points. So the first, um, the Yan Shui Tong um, moral realism. So he, Yan Shui Tong actually, he tried to learn his moral realism, tried to learn from the concepts of um, Wang Dao. Or, or he translated um, the Qian authority in Chinese um, preaching thought as a source of knowledge and idea to reconceptualize um, the realist vision of the power. So according to Yan, um, the main authority of Wang Dao is not something um, that one can strive for, rather it is acquired uh, by setting the example of the virtue and morality, winning the hearts um, the, of the people by doing so. So in this band, um, the virtues and morality are quality um, that can be inherent in the conduct of the state and also its leader, um, which can influence others to act in one's favor and become the source of the political power. So the second one, the Zhao Tingyang, um, is a Tianxia system. So it is a theory based straw on the idealized version of the Tianxia system of the Zhou dynasty as a part of uh, dynamics model. So he argued that um, the system uh, was all inclusive um, geographically, psychologically, and also institutionally. And it is there, um, it's therefore belong to the old human uh, equity. And it's more peace-driven than the Westphalian system, uh, which was um, yeah, dominate, it has dominated the world order uh, for centuries. And then the third one is Qin Ya Qin. Um, it's a theory of the rationality. And so it's a theory basically um, centered around the concept of relationality or Guan Xi. The idea that is embedded in the Confucianism. So they argue the Chinese uh, view their um, social world as a world of interconnectedness. So, from the Chinese relational perspective, uh, the international society is not as a symbol as an independent entity acting in, in an um, ego, egoistically uh, rational way um, in response to um, the given structure. Um, instead, uh, it is a complex web of relation uh, made up of the states related to one or another, yeah, one another in different ways. 
So in, in short, um, I think although the concept of anecdotes, uh, they characterize their, uh, the, these three uh, Chinese scholars' works. Um, um, yeah, they, they have a different focus. Uh, they all try to change the, the marginalization of China in the theory of international relations and hope that um, the China, which is um, on the periphery, the knowledge can also become the knowledge uh, producer. Now I move to the uh, move on to the final um, part. So I think the popularity of the Chinese school has um, uh, received um, um, much a lot of criticism um, in um, in in yeah in the discipline. And the most important um, of which are the following um, two plans. So the um, the first is that um, so the critiques argue the, the Chinese school, um, um, their reference to the historical documents and, and classics are either um, inaccurate or overly uh, rom uh, romanticized. Um, so it also infers and imperious the form of the Chinese um, exceptionalism. So it is kind of a wishful thinking um, that China will be different uh, from any other great power in its behavior or uh, its position. And then the second criticism is that um, so the, the knowledge developed by the Chinese school is only used to uh, legitimize um, the rise of China. So it mainly aims to safeguard um, Chinese um, national interests and also justify um, China's one-party uh, system. I think in my opinion, I think these two um, Criticism on valid, but not unique to uh, China. Because by this standard, I think it's much of other works in IR uh, would have to be uh, discounted. So American IR scholarship also uses the resources and material anachronistically and as a critique of the realism uh, have already observed. And um, the realism or yeah, their agenda also reflects um, um, for instance, American um, interests and concern. And likewise, the, the liberalism of the international relation uh, can also be seen as a rationalization of um, American Western hegemonics in um, the rest of the, the world. So I, I think EHR, um, yeah, I think in, I don't know, um, in 1977, I mean, in his letter to um, Hoffman, I think he has already, yeah, and he has already wrote some. So what is these things called international relations in uh, the English-speaking uh, country, other than the study about how to run the world from the position of the strength? So in other places, at other time, it might be something else. Uh, but within those states, which had some um, interest, as opposed to those um, they did not. So it was a little more than rationalization for the exercise of the power by the dominant nation over the weeks. So there was no signs of international direction. The subject so-called uh, was the um, ideology of the control masking as a, as a proper academic discipline. So this is a quote from um, E.H. Hart. Of course, I think so make, making the comparison between American hegemony and also its connection to mainstream IR, on the one hand, and also the rise of China is the Chinese the school on the other, does not by itself justify um, the enterprises of the Chinese school from critical IR perspective. So it is worth mentioning that on various occasions, the critiques like William Kalaha, I believe he, he was here last, um, last year and uh, also gave the lecture perhaps in this room. So he has been, yeah. So they have been very, very cautious about um, the Chinese school uh, as, um, as another familiar um, hegemonic design. So to, to some extent, um, the Chinese school scholars are indeed um, replicating the mainstream IR theory and also its problem. So attempts by uh, Yan, Yan Xue Tong, Zhao Tingyang, or Qin Ya Qin, um, yeah, their attempts to uh, Reinvigorate some of the traditional Chinese concepts like the Wang Dao, the Tijia system, or the Guanxi. 
actually they channel the Chinese food into the American mainstream higher discourse. So including like the realism, their notion of power, the liberal logic of um, cosmopolitanism, and also the constructivism idea of the relationality. So the, you can say it's a Chinese school actually they use against the West the, the concept and the themes that mainstream IR currently use against the non-Western worlds. So at the first thought, I think their concern uh, seems to represent a reasonable uh, response to the Chinese school from a critical uh, perspective. So the post um, Michel Foucault's um, post structures of yeah, for critical uh, scholars, I think he pointed out some, so he said that humanity does not um, gradually uh, progress from combat to combat until it arrives at universal responsibility where the rule of law finally replaces warfare. He says that humanity can stow each of its bias in a system of rule um, and, and therefore proceed from domination to I think what Foucault is um, trying to, to, to say here is that so when one, when, when some people think, actually think of a successful uh, resistance, uh, that is um, the dissolution of, the old, of an old subjectivity, um, we merely or simply produce a new subjectivity, so, which become another form of, um, of domination. So there exists a circular um, relation between domination and resistance. So from this perspective, um, the development of the Chinese school, accompanied with the rise of China, would potentially become another form um, of hegemonics. Nevertheless, what I want to ask in, um, in my paper is, um, so the, I think I have three questions with regard to the, yeah, those, um, so the, was pretty simple. So the, the first one is, um, I think, um, if the enterprises of the Chinese school of the resistance against the Western and German is turned out to be another form of domination, then this, that means this um, resistance um, is ultimately uh, pointless. And also, it's possible to uh, imitate the Western discourse. Um, but yeah, it is possible, whether it is possible that imitating Western discourse can still constitute kind of a critical uh, resistance. Or to put the question differently, so how, and also to what extent, uh, can the rise of China together uh, with its knowledge, uh, taken from the Chinese school of constitute an effective form of critical resistance against the, what, what we have normally uh, taken for granted in IR. So to answer these um, both questions, um, I think it is worth looking into the Homi Baba, um, his notion of um, uh, mimicry. So for Baba, um, mimicry is um, a powerful tool um, to resist uh, colonial authority. So when colonizers um, or hegemonic culture and the colonized imperial culture, they come into contact, um, the colonizers um, try to avoid, yeah, they will try to put their cultural ideology above the colonized. And so the colonizers, they believe um, they are more superior than the indigenous population. And the later should be assimilated by the advanced people. They should learn the colonizers to own values, cultural, and morals. So the attitude of the colonizer is contradictory contradictory and ambivalent, however. So on the one hand, so they encourage the indigenous population to imitate themselves. However, they are simultaneously afraid of being imitated. So worrying that the later the colonized they become their own clones. So the in the colonial India, for instance, so the simulation strategy was to produce British themselves, sorry, British mimickers, but not the British themselves. So to Baba, this um, distinction is um, important. Because on the one hand, the colonial discourse encouraged the, and also guides the improvement of the, the colonized um, to gradually approach the civilization of the, of the, of the colonizers. On the, other, on the other hand, 
It also used the ontological differences, like a dual skin color and, and so on and so forth, and the variety to resist the possibility of a perfect uh, or complete uh, imitation. So that's why the Homi Baba yeah, is almost the same, but not quite. And to, yeah, uh, to colonizers, um, so the colonizers governed the colonies under the banner of uh, spreading the spirits of the uh, freedom equality. But they would never give the indigenous people the same freedom and equality. Because they, yeah, they are almost the same, but not quite. So the colonizer, sorry, colonized them, they knew this, and, and therefore they have to find a way to protect themselves from being further alienated and dominated by the Western hegemonic culture. So as a result, according to Hobi Baba, um, so they employ a mimicry strategy as a form of the form of resistance. So post-colonial mimicry occurs when the less powerful colonial or post-colonial subjects uh, displace the powerful colonizer states by mimicking their action, but never exactly becoming them. So I think the Chinese Aya scholar actually, they, they also believe that although the China seems to have um, acquired its own sovereignty, that the Western, the Caliphate Germany, still post them in another form. So Western hegemony in, instill their ideologies in non-Western worlds, which give the non-Western worlds the desire to imitate the Western indefinitely. So these ideologies instill involve various fields, such as knowledge, language, and education. Therefore, they, the Chinese scholars think they, if they do not take action to resist the Western culture hegemony. So the results, uh, um, yeah, the, this, um, yeah, this will result in a com yeah, in complete um, inferiority. Uh, constant, yeah, co uh, consequentially, they follow um, the mimicry uh, strategy. So from the works of um, uh, Yan Shui Tong, Zhao Ting Yang, Qi Yang Qing, as I explained earlier, you can see this, um, this process of um, Immigrants. So the, yeah, like the, yeah, they, they use the power of cosmopolitanism and rationality, uh, relationality, and also other concepts. Uh, they are almost identical to those of the mainstream IR theory. However, I argue the, the connotation of these concepts uh, are not exactly the same as the original Western meaning. So their mimicry um, is not um, a simple duplication of the Western discourse, but use the opportunity to imitate um, the mainstream IR theory, pretending to enter the mainstream um, Western discourse. So the Chinese IR scholars, they imitate the Western theory, but at the same time, they will also transform the Western theory uh, to bring them more in line with Chinese tradition. As a result, um, the Chinese scholar, uh, they can make the novel, they still can make the novel innovative contribution to the literature of Aya through the mimicry, um, hybridization, and also modification of the initial um, notion. Since it is an imitation, so it cannot be real, almost the same, but not quite. So as a result, I mean, the mimicry is a concealed and also a destructive destructive the form of the resistance in the anti-colonial uh, strategies. However, um, yeah, this seems to be an issue at the heart of um, the enterprises of the Chinese school from the Homi Baba's um, colonial resistance uh, uh, perspective. So to, to Baba, actually, so he, he's, he says uh, hierarchical plans to like, inherit originality or purity of the culture are untenable. So even before we report to empirical historical uh, instance that um, demonstrates their uh, hybridity. So I think the Homi Baba himself, he is strongly against the, the cultural uh, essentialism. And I think it's undeniably, I think the Chinese school has manifested in several degrees of essentialism in account of Chinese history and tradition. So it, it, the Chinese school actually, they, yeah, they did some uh, uh, Jakarta's 
um, the China and the West, uh, centralizing and also extending the existence of the Chinese culture, which in a sense um, is hybrid of fluidism. So the essentialism, essentialism is something um, of the taboo in the critical lines of IR uh, scholarship. However, um, to me, I think some, there's some problem um, with some Omibala uh, Hazen thinking. Because I think when the critical theories critique of um, essentialism go, uh, goes too far, it can also threaten the very foundation on which the res resistance rests. So in order to meaningfully challenge the hegemonies, I think we still need a side of agencies or the subjects. So the problem is Toby Bob thought he said he ignored um, the symmetric the power relation between the colonizers and the, the colonized. So no, no matter how much the identity of the colonizers and the colonized are disturbing, uh, it is difficult to fundamentally change the true colonial uh, relation, the power relation between the ruler and rule, and between the hegemonics and inferior culture. Moreover, um, Baba also implicit, his theory also implicitly uh, presupposed that um, the colonial power relation will eventually be broken uh, regardless whether um, the colonized activity exists or not. I think this is a problem because the colonizers can simply ignore the inherent contradictions of the, the colonial discourse and just continue to carry out some the colonial rules and also steadily maintain their self-identity. As a result, the Homi Baba's um, uh, style of resistance of um, the colonized was not enough to overthrow the over structure of the power relation. So the subversion of the colonial power structure uh, certainly required hybrid strategies, but they also required the deal of constitutional resistance strategy and also rebellious action. So the theoretical difficulties, I mean, derived from this point of view is that um, um, it's, yeah, it's the extent to which the degree of um, essentialism is um, desirable. So to avoid the um, homibabas um, is trouble. So I suggest actually we need to turn our gaze to uh, Spivak's um, his notion of um, strategic, uh, strategic essentialism. So to speed box, the centralism is um, the object to be deconstructed. However, deconstruction also depends on the centralism. So yeah, so she, yes, she states, so yeah, she, she says, I think it is absolutely on target to take a stance against the discourse of the centralism. But strategically, we cannot. So on the issue of um, the feminism, so the Spivak, he opposed the so-called feminine um, nature. Um, the, yeah, the women are maybe, yeah, maybe they have a different uh, class, different, um, yeah, different social class and so on and so forth. So he, he thinks that it is impossible, practically impossible to define women. So then the implication of de defining women is the creation of a stream, the binary, the dualistic the view of gender. And as a deconstructivism, she is um, against the seeking uh, such dualistic notion. Although she opposed the defining an absolute a fixed nature of women, from the standpoint of uh, standpoints of a political stru uh, struggle, she believed that um, the historical and complete nature of a woman uh, still exists and uh, can be used as a weapon of um, struggle. So in light of Spivak's uh, thoughts, um, I think it is inevitably uh, inevitable to adhere to essentialism to a certain degree when, engage, when engaging in the post-Western uh, higher theory, although we must be uh, vigilant. So there is no need to discard the Chinese higher perspective altogether. Rather, we need to use the Chinese school uh, critically rather than uh, treating them as a purely objective standpoint um, that produce truth. 
So I are large of all sorts and needs to be produced in a refractive um, spirit. So everything is um, dangerous, but they are not all equally dangerous at the same time. So there should be a hierarchy of dangerousness. So the field of IR theory has um, still been highly Eurocentric, and international politics are still dominated by Western um, hegemonies, as I showed in the beginning of um, my presentation. So I think the Chinese um, school um, might one day um, turn out to be another form of domination in the near future. But this, at that time, then we need to reflect um, on our reprisal of the um, Chinese school today. So I think the strategic essentialism will always be a powerful weapon um, in the critical tradition of the um, IR this So conclusion, um, as I say, I think the Eurocentrism, um, yeah, in the IR, the field of IR, or theory, or the international study, um, still highly Eurocentric. So. And also the international politics are still dominated by the Western hegemonies. So some of you might ask us, what's wrong with it? Especially, I think, from the perspective of the Taiwanese, I mean, society. I mean, so in order to counter the Chinese um, hegemony, shouldn't we celebrate um, uh, the prevalence of American centrism in the world? I think you, some of you may have um, these um, questions. I don't know, I mean, now it's, I'm sure that everyone's following the, uh, what's happening in, in Ukraine. So, I, mean, I think five days ago, right, and Biden just said actually, the, yeah, Putin uh, is um, um, a war criminal. I think maybe, yeah, I think Biden is, um, he, he might be right. Um, but how about these two guys, uh, George Bush and Tony Blair? Uh, yeah. Are they also war criminal tools? And also, the, if you follow the news, you, you may see a lot of civilian the casualties um, um, in Ukraine. But this is actually the civilian casualties of um, the Iraqi war. So this is the millions and millions of civilians. They also die um, during um, the, the invasion of um, Iraq by um, the United States. And if your memory is not too short, and just actually just um, last year, um, last summer, actually this was also the, the civilian deaths in, in Kabul. Um, strike. So when the United States um, decided to withdraw their uh, troop from from the country, and they also killed yeah six children and yeah family. And later it's proved actually there was no um, terrorist um, um, attacks attempt. So the and also the thing about um, Taiwan. I think in Taiwan's IR, I think we. We find actually the there's the, yeah you can find actually I mean when we study IR in in Taiwan actually you find actually we we basically teach the um, American Western IR so I um, sort of like my research assistant uh, Xing Xiang is helping me to um, collect all the the courses offered um, in Taiwan so you can find actually they I think you can find actually Taiwan um, Taiwanese IR actually is. Um, yeah, we are still very uh, receptive to um, to American or Western IR. So the question is why? And so so to understand, yeah. So I think to, to understand some how the international study develops into the field of study in contemporary Taiwan, I think it's um, it's, um, it's essential to understand why um, yeah, when we study IR in Taiwan, why we are why we are still so uh, receptive to mainstream um, IR. So the, this is actually the, another part of my project which I, I'm still working on. on this. Um, so I think, that, I think it's to Taiwanese or the, or the IR scholars in Taiwan, I think you might, yeah, they, they think actually in order to gain the support from the West, actually we need to speak the Western language and also by retaining um, the core, the problematics problem of Taiwan is facing at various um, times. So, 
So actually, this is a multiple choice, right? So we, we, we choose to, because we, we need to um, fight against um, the change of hegemony. So the, the Western IR or the mainstream IR become, uh, yeah, be, become, become the friends. And so, but, but still, I think we need to know why we, we made this um, choice and, and where this um, choice came from. And also in what um, the power relation um, we met, we met them rather than accepting the Western or American views without thinking. I think this is quite to me. This is quite uh, crucial because um, to focus actually. So the yeah, because it's a post structure, and he he always try to remind remind us of um, yeah we are all as a subject. So we all constitute it in. Power relation. So he thinks actually the target today actually is not really to discover what we are, but to refuse what we are, to deconstruct yourself in order to see how you as a person, as a subject, you are constituted in um, the power relation. And also Gramsci he also says um, um, the starting point of the critical elaboration actually is the conscious, uh, consciousness of uh, what one really uh, is. So. I think I will end my presentation with this. Yeah, we, we should know ourselves. Where are we from? And why are we constituted in a certain way? How, you know, why we become who we are today? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Huang. I have a little bit of time for drink. And I believe we now all have uh, multiple ideas uh, because this has been very uh, inspiring and ask us to question a lot of uh, from you know uh, uh, question ourselves huh? so I guess this is a very stimulating lecture and we have we have around 30 minutes for a QA session and we welcome a very open and direct discussion with our lecturer anyone has already formulated some thoughts? I always need to ask the first question. <laughs> I'm to ask the first one. You mentioned about it, um, the Chinese exceptionalism. Um, I have a thought. Uh, last year, I was invited to participate in a workshop that communicating with people from uh, the university. So I wrote something about the comparison of American exceptionalism. So, um, so in my in my short comments, um, the comparison of the American exceptionalism. I don't think this is working. <laughs> There's a, a very obvious uh, differences, but maybe not in the so-called uh, the knowledge, the knowledge production. But more, it's about uh, to be a nation. Then the behavior is actually quite different. I, I haven't really had a clue how to connect this with your argument, but I just want to share my thought. I think the Chinese exceptionalism is more like the the, the uh, essential differences in the civilization. So the uh, so the Chinese scholars, they feel that they have different origins of history and you know, also different origins of civilization. So um, all the rules or the regulation of discipline in IR um, just just don't fit. I mean, they they don't feel they can fit, and and that's the reason why it becomes quite problematic when people, no matter if it's a Chinese scholar or um, now Chinese, but when we are trying to find ex, uh, explanation to explain a lot of behaviors or policies uh, after the so-called China rising, it becomes quite problematic. But American exceptionalism is like uh, they build the regulation, they build the hierarchy, but they are on the top, they are outside of the hierarchy. So they can continue to stay on the dominance. They don't need to consider whether the regulation feed everybody including themselves or not, especially themselves. Because 
It just, they don't feel they need to be regulated. Even the regulation is created by them. So that's the reason why when you, so I think that's also explain uh, when we see what is happening right now in the real world affairs, uh, all the, uh, the criticism or all the um, condemnation that the US leaders accuse Russia, it just, for them, it doesn't matter whether I did this before or not. It's just because I'm the top of the hierarchy, I'm the top, I'm, 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 I'm totally exceptional out of these regulations. So I have the legitimacy to do the criticism. I think if one day, uh, if the Chinese go IR, if they really survive, and then they can really become one of the important uh, theoretical factions in IR, I kind of wonder would that become the same, like uh, what we are facing the American IR. I mean, the dominant or the hegemonic position right now. Because I think uh, fundamentally they have very different thought in terms of the so-called, uh, whether they are exceptional from the discipline or not. Yeah, thank you, Chen Chung. I think I do believe, yeah. I don't know actually, but I think it's very likely actually the Chinese. Or oh, China actually, they might act just like the United States. Uh, acting now, but, um, but we have to see, but my point is, yeah, I agree with, that. with you, I think I, but I think we, but, but I think we will, we can leave this question to, to the near future, and whether China will become just another hegemony, just like the United States, I actually don't know exactly, the, just like you said, um, the exceptionists, I mean, the Chinese exceptionists, and the American exceptionists, Make sure they're quite different in their logics and nature. And um, so it's hard to predict whether, um, of course, if you ask this question to the Chinese school scholar, they would say actually will behave differently when they become the hegemonic power. But, but we don't know yet. And, uh, but I think we can we can leave these questions I mean, to the near future. And, uh, but for now, I think it's um, to me the maybe the most crucial, most Urgent issue in the study of IR is um, how to uh, how to challenge or resist uh, American or European centuries in, uh, in, in this. So this is my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Any other feedback, comments? Yes, please. And the microphone. First of all, uh, I'm Hong Yunlu from uh, Graduate Institute of uh, East Asian Studies. Uh, I have a question for you because uh, I'm very curious about, uh, I'm sure that you teach uh, Chinese international relations uh, in your school, but I wonder that uh, how your students think about Chinese international relations and how, how do I think about like Yan Xuetong or Qin Yajin's theory? Do they like, buy then or do, do do you do you think they are agree with that or because they are they have different cultures from Chinese culture so I'm sure they might have different ideas about Chinese international relations. Thank you for your question. I, I think some um, yeah I do teach them yeah the Chinese school um, in my I think introduction to international uh, relations and in in the course so in that course I can basically teach all the. Um, all the theories of international uh, relations. So I also include the section uh, on the Chinese school. So I introduce them, uh, Yan Xue Tong, Zhao Tingyang, and Qin Ya Qing. It's quite interestingly, actually, they, they do find their um, theory um, uh, interesting and useful. Especially, I think they, they like the Zhao Tingyang. Um, because we use the theory to discuss the, how to yeah, the global the climate change and, and global warming. And they do find them. The Zhao Tingyang uh, theory idea is quite quite useful until they read um, the Kalahan's critique of uh, of, um, of Zhao Tingyang, and then it's become very um, uh, suspicious of um, attempts by uh, 
by, by the Chinese school scholar. And also, I actually also, um, together with my students, we also run in a research project. And so we try to uh, use the, the Yan Xue Tong's models, um, not in the case of um, China, but try to apply the Yan Xue Tong's realism to, to other parts of the world. So we, uh, we, we, uh, we try to understand how the, the political power Yan Xue Tong's theory yeah, how, how the political power uh, is manifested so, in the United States uh, during, um, during the Donald Trump uh, his administration. And we also work on the, um, like the Middle East. So, so this is, um, I, I think in general, I think the student to find some of the Chinese school, my European, or the dark, yeah, European student, I think they do find their theory um, interesting, but they also, they are also very, very critical to, uh, they, 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 I think most of them do think actually those, are, yeah, because they are Chinese, they are Chinese scholars, so they, uh, they must have their own uh, agenda, and they, they, they are also closely uh, connected to, um, to the Beijing, to the Chinese government, so, which, which is true, I think. Thank you. Interesting. Yes, please. Yeah, a follow up question. Yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It's funny. It's funny. <laughs> okay. So my question, I, I really like resonated with many like your point of view in your PowerPoint. Thank you very much for your impressive uh, presentation. Well, uh, no, my question is, it's not really a question. This is my own like perspective, my re reflection after like listening to your PowerPoint uh, your presentation. Um, my reflection is, is Chinese school is pure Chinese school, because uh, from my perspective, like uh, many China, many Chinese scholars, many, Chi many Chinese IR scholars, they actually, they take uh, Western IR elements for granted for many years, and uh, they, uh, they study and read about these theories for many years, and uh, they, uh, and probably, and, and, and probably they might think from the perspective of Western IR scholars, that they, they, they even themselves don't don't really know about that. Like, uh, I'm really impre impressed by the, the introduction of you, uh, uh, three Chinese scholars, like Yuan Xuetong and uh, Zhao Pingyang and Qin Yaqing. What really like, impressed me is that two of them actually obtained the, the PhD degree in, in the United States. And so, so this, is very, this is rather like conflicting to me, actually. So, um, yeah, they, maybe they, and uh, the wording of their theories, like moral realism, Tianxia system, and uh, relational re relation to theory, yeah. this wording, realism, uh, what's, up, what's, up, what's up, system and theory, they, they, these wordings are all from Western yeah. using. So this is my own perspective. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, yeah this is, so that's why this is in, in my paper, I try to argue basically. Yeah. Those are Chinese scholars, and even the Zhao Tingyang. I mean, he did his PhD in in, in China, and he, he never um, studied abroad. But but he he writes Kant, yeah, yeah, Kant, um, yeah, and also he's familiar with um, the John Rawls, um, his um, the theory of um, of just, justice, because he's a philosopher. He's not a uh, uh, scholar. But I do think that but in the beginning you say um, I think you're quite right whether. Chinese school is really Chinese because I think you are from Vietnam and um, and some um, yeah or South Korea. I mean those are society which are influenced by um, by traditional Confucianism. Actually, maybe you could argue um, yeah those um, like Tian Xia system because in Vietnam in the history you also have your own um, the tributary um, system and of course the relationality and the Guan Xi is also important. I think it's not only in Confucian's um, the society, but any other countries in, in the yes. world. But this is a problem of the Qin Ya Qing, so it's a very good relationality because you cannot, yeah, yeah, you cannot claim those, those um, attributes of relationality actually really only belong to, to China or Chinese. And uh, when we talk about China or Chinese, actually, it doesn't, China or Chinese is uh, especially, if you consider some um, its history, 
it's, um, it's not homogeneous um, uh, civilization. It's uh, it's um, the people from 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 Xinjiang, from north, from the south. Actually, they are all very very um, different. But I think the same problem again. I think the same to the um, like the English school. I think I think the most of them, the English schools got they are not British. They are, and also the, the English lecture was um, original. I think that um, um, many of them actually work in, in Australia. And like the place where I did my PhD, Arismis, in security studies, we also we also have a, a school called the Arismis School. It's, um, yeah, it's, yeah. So we, we do uh, um, the critical um, security studies. But again, I mean, so I remember the Ken Booth um, at the time, he's also one of the advocates of the, the, the Welsh yeah yeah Abrisian school originally is called the Welsh school and it's yeah it isn't called Abrisian school but they found this quite problematic to always uh, use the yeah the, the name the name of the nation to, to describe the, yeah yeah they found this quite problematic so, so that's why they later on they, they changed the name from the Welsh school to um, to Abrisian school but like English school, I think, yeah, they still we, we still keep using um, this name because mm -hmm. it's um I think it's a problem and uh, so the whether um, so what is Chinese school whether it's um, a plural um, whether it's um, there exists a homogeneous Chinese school I think this um, it's, um yeah we can we can this question. I think you, when your presentation kind of starts, if I look at it from a chronological perspective, kind of starts at the beginning of, of the 20th century, right? Um, so, uh, how much is it connected? Um, the 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 relevance of um, uh, the Indian school uh, thought, or you know, Western I, Western based IR theories, to um, the expand the, the, the discovery of the new world uh, by the Europeans and the expansion worldwide of uh, European civilization but also uh, religion um, you know and, and all these uh, obviously affecting uh, many people's uh, uh, beliefs and thoughts around the world uh, how, to, how to view the world right um, I think that's my, my first uh, uh, question slash comment uh, and then the other one is, uh, um, I find it interesting about that uh, Baba's uh, mimicry um, concept or argument. Um, looking at it not from a theory perspective, but from a, the real world perspective, I'm wondering if uh, China is acting the same as the West now well, with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, but not, it's not exactly with the BRI itself, but with other, um, uh, so to say, pillars within an international structure that it wants to build through the Belt and Road Initiative. For example, I, uh, I'm saying this because I presented a, a paper uh, just recently in a conference where uh, I was, uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, comparing, comparing the BRI with the Marshall Plan and the, in, uh, people like to just focus on you know the similarities between China constructing uh, all sorts of um, physical infrastructure around the world, ports, you name it. Um, but what I argue was that uh, we need to kind of uh, broaden the, the scope here 
and kind of look at other uh, pillars, for example, um, uh, uh, ranging from technological policy and institutional. Um, so like uh, institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF, uh, uh, and then and China's uh, you know push to uh, uh, recently just uh, seven years ago or so to um, uh, create the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, and also the New Development Bank uh, through the BRICS Corporation uh, scheme. Um, but also, at least in the Western experience, there was this uh, technological advantage. I think you briefly mentioned that in your presentation. And obviously, uh, China is not, doesn't find, doesn't, it's not finding itself in the same position as the West in the Marshall time period. But uh, there have been talks uh, more uh, by prominent uh, people like uh, Klaus Schwab on the World Economic Forum where he discusses this fourth industrial revolution uh, kind of uh, starting or happening right before our eyes, but then he, he argues that this coming decade, from the 2020s to the 2030s, is a critical decade uh, uh, because of, uh, of perceived or predicted advances in like, biotechnology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and all sorts of technologies. Um, so, in that sense, is, uh, do you view China as building kind of the same structure and hoping that it will be uh, somewhat um, blessed with uh, technological advances in the near future that will position it as, um, as the West was once and then and because of it then being able to sort of uh, become closer to being a hegemony instead of a dominant power, uh, right? Because we talk about China, you know, China's rise and being dominant now, but uh, to me, it's not yet there uh, in terms of technology, technological dominance, and also cultural and ideological, right? The West, you know, think of Hollywood. We, we, we all of those, um, you know, movies. They, they, affect our own way of thinking, right? Uh, so, uh, but China is not there yet, at least. Uh, and if I had one last point, um, I come from Latin America, and I came across a, um, one of the surveys that they do uh, in the region, um, and one of the questions was, uh, and this was asking all the countries in Latin America, do you think Chinese influence is um, important? And my country was, the, the one country in America that uh, where most people perceive Chinese influence as welcoming, which I found that very interesting. Uh, and the other extreme was the United States saying that they, they had negative views uh, with that. So those two questions are Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, yeah, I actually love to read your, your paper on um, comparison to Marshall Plan. I think at first, I think I, I, I don't think China is um, is hegemony. Really. Yeah, yeah. I think it's still far, mm -hmm. far from there. Um, especially if you consider um, the hegemony in in branches, in the sense. I mean, I mean, especially after the COVID nineteen, I think, um, and also the, the ongoing the Ukraine wars. I think it's um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think that you can. I, I think it's actually the. At least, uh, because I teach um, IR in, in Europe, I found that more and more my students actually um, let them become more, how should I put, um, more skeptical, yeah, they, they become more skeptical um, to, um, to the rise of China. So, if you think it's actually the, so I think the China's, um, yeah, can be described as a, like a like a, in yeah, raw costs actually make this distinction between Germany and and and, and the premises. Sorry. Yeah, the prim yeah. I think so. I think China can be regarded as a, like an economic um, um, power, um, the super power, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, the United States. But I think in terms of um, the culture, ideologies, and idea, I think China is still far behind um, the United States. But on the other hand, I, I think um, the Chinese model of um, development uh, 
I think it, has, it, has, it, it does have some um, it, it does have some selling points I mean, to to other developing um, the country. Um, so the, this is yeah. So people call it the China model. So it's um, yeah, it's the combination of um, maybe authoritarianism and that um, uh, adopts the markets and commons and, and so on and so forth. And so this um, yeah, this might be um, the alternative. Um, model to some other developing country and, and so in that regard um, I think the in terms of like um, so power or the um, yeah ideology the competition is the way I think China is still far behind but but I think they compared to the Soviet Union during the Cold War I mean China is um, in terms yeah I think yeah I think China is a more um, yes yeah, it's, it's, it's more powerful than the Soviet Union um, during the Cold War, and also the the BI you asked them whether um, whether BRI and yeah whether China actually imitates um, the uh, like Marshall plans in mean, yeah right after the, uh, the, the Second World War. I, it, it just reminds me of um, um, the um, I think the Harvard um, the professor from the Yen Johnston. I think he wrote the books called the China's Social States. And so in the books, he, he tried to describe describes how the China um, has been socialized in in the current international system. So you can say actually, especially after the, um, the opening the reform and opening up era, in China really tried to to learn how the, the system works in the international relation, and they try to. Also try to imitate them. Of course, the just like I argue in my papers, all the imitation um, mimicry is not some. It's not a, yeah. It's not the the one hundred percent the duplication of the original. So of, of course they they make some the motivation, and this is where the so like BRI some art I mean, yeah some scholar actually they do use the Qin Yao Qin um, um, his some um, theory of the rationality. To, um, to to find yeah to, to study the Chinese um, the, yeah the BRI and see how um, it is different from um, the yeah the for instance the martial uh, martial plans and uh, so I forgot your first question and ah so, um uh, it was uh, um yeah so there was a quote uh, saying that the status of the hegemony is not only material power but on yeah belief and ideology. Yeah. And I was wondering how much is that also a result of, um, for example, in the case of uh, the prominence of Western IR theories, um, the result of uh, the, the expansion of uh, Western uh, ideas and beliefs and religion and culture uh, from, you know, uh, uh, 1940, uh, 1492 till later. Um, and then because of that, uh, um, most people, most scholars in the world receiving uh, Western education. Of course, the, I mean, the, the Western hegemony, I mean, in Gramsci's sense, actually, it's, it's a result of, um, of, um, of the, the European imperialism, colonialism, and all, yeah, which is still, uh, yeah, still existing. Um, in today's world, of course, this is um, the result of them. That's why they it's so hard to to resist um, um, the Western. This has a long, um, long, very very long history, two, you know, two or three um, hundred years. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, but you are right. This is the result of um, of this um, yeah, colonialism and imperialism in the past two or three um, centuries. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one other remark. Anybody? I don't know. All right. Well, I, I have a small like a reflection. I don't have a very well um, formulated thought, but I, I want to thank Professor Huang for giving us this. Uh, this thought-provoking lecture because I really appreciate that you brought up 
this post-Western research agenda for all of us. I think it's very important for us to, you know, question our imagination and our research framework. But I, I always find one thing particularly difficult for myself. That is, uh, we, we all went to Western countries to study art because the whole discipline is a Western discipline, right? So we all went there and we all gather all these you know, analytical framework and approaches, and it was so easy. <laughs> like, it, the, everything was written. Like, every theory, every approach, every ontological, epistemological elements was well written in forms, in norms, in regulations, with concepts, with terms. So as a foreigner, as a outsider of a Western discipline, it was just very easy to catch up with their thoughts, with their ideas and philosophy. And I think in the whole liberal order, there was space for criticism. Yeah. Like they are built up by the idea of openness, of liberalization. So there was space for discussion, for criticism, for critical thinking. That's part of the the whole the whole agenda, right? So we could have all these. Uh, critical ideas within the liberal agenda. It was okay. And then uh, it was until I began to do research on Europe-China relations, I began to approach the, the Chinese schools of IRs and this post-Western uh, global uh, order uh, that is driven by the Chinese school of IR. And in this school, I also find interesting elements and useful tools and approaches, etc., etc. But somehow, first of all, I think it's more difficult to use it as a as a theory to apply to different empirical cases because it's not written very specifically as the Western approaches. It's it's more difficult for foreigners and outsiders. Even I myself consider as a you know a grown someone grew up in a uh, Confucius uh, civilization, but the concepts, the terms, it's not very, you know, clearly well written. So it's, it's, it's more difficult. And secondly, I think there is no space for criticism in this, in this approach. Like the, I'm not, uh, but of course, I'm not yet a specialist in Chinese schools of art, but the one experience I had uh, in an academic discussion with Chinese scholars. It was a conference in Shanghai. It was focused on EU-related topics, but it was in China with Chinese academic circle. And I, and I found very, very much limited in the space of discussion. Like there is an unspoken boundary. Everyone was very cautious, and there are certain things that you just cannot touch upon. And I think that limits this post-Western discussion because there is no room for debates not like a, like a you know fully fleshed room for debates and I think for a, any intellectual uh, discussion you need to have that and I think that is a big limitation uh, from the Chinese school I, that's my preliminary uh, thoughts of all that and any other final yes I have a, um, I just remember I may have made a comment here. You have a slide, uh, again, another quote from somebody else. They mentioned about the uh, position of strength. Can you go back to that slide? Sorry, position, position of strength. Um, it, was, it was one of the long quotes with one of the pictures. Oh, the EH yeah, cards. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, that one. Was it? The, the 26th? Six. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, uh, oh yes, okay. Um, and th this this quote kind of reminded me of something that happened last year. Uh, one of the, um, I think it was the first uh, meeting between the Biden administration and the Chinese government mm -hmm. in Alaska. Uh, so it says here in the quote. Um, uh, So what, what, what is this, uh, right? Uh, it's how, how to, about how to run the world from positions of strength. Yeah. And I think um, 
I don't know if China, I mean, if I look at that meeting and, uh, and see how that meeting progressed and uh, developed, if China was kind of responding to the US uh, because, I mean, of course not because of this quote, but uh, from this perspective, uh, that uh, Yang Jiexi, right, yeah, that's his name, uh, he said uh, um, something that I still remember in my, in my head, I mean, because it's, it's uh, you know, one uh, rising power telling a uh, uh, hegemonic established power. Um, and I quote him saying, so I was like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, China telling that to the United States, that's, you know, I mean, telling them, don't talk to us from a position of strength. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm wondering how, you know, how that would affect uh, international relations going forward. Uh, because 30 years ago, I don't think uh, they would have been in a position to, to tell the U.S. that, but now they are. So I, I was just uh, kind of uh, intrigued by that uh, reaction from them. Yeah, I, I think I do very, I mean, Chinese foreign policy become much more assertive. Yes. <laughs> but, but also become more aggressive as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, um, yeah, like the company yeah, the week you, you mentioned, I mean, mm -hmm. you can, yeah, I think we can find a lot of them. Um, Especially, I think, um, under Xi Jinping, and, yeah, I think the you know, Hu Jintao and, and earlier on, I mean, they still try to um, not hide, but um, yeah, but not less assertive. Um, but now, like, I think, under the Xi Jinping, yeah, you can find actually you now they become very, um, very assertive. But this is actually, but this kind of um, mentality, like the EH card, I mean, the war politics or studied war, but it's always the yeah, the, yeah, it's how to run, yeah. Yeah, how to yeah how to run the world from the position of the strength. So this is actually what the, the Chinese. So Chinese, um, they think the, the Western United States actually they normally see the Chinese like um, um, the Chinese and need to be um, properly educated mm -hmm. so so as to behave properly in international relations, mm -hmm. um, more civilized in the way. So this is actually kind of the. Um, uh, Mentality that the Chinese uh, the group leaders they, they have. Um, so they so the uh, the scenario you describe actually is um, I think it's a reaction to yeah it's a manifestation of these mindsets and how it's react to um, because China thinks they now they will they come to cross actually now they come um, so they uh, they should be in a position to uh, speak for themselves that has been um, being instructed by the Western power. How to behave in international relations. Right, thank you very much. Well, the time is never enough for the for interesting discussion, but thank you very much, Professor Fong, for joining us, and thank you uh, very much. I hope we see each other again. Bye bye. <laughs>